Let's well begin. I think, yes, we are basically at class time. Uh, it looks like the usual post midterm turnout. Um, nice to see all of you anyway. Thank you for coming. Um, I think it's an interesting theme today. We already alluded a little bit to what's going on at the time of the Congress of Vienna. Last week we talked about, of course, the, uh, the famous 100 days, which curiously actually took place during the Congress of Vienna. The 100 days, remember, being Napoleon's kind of last hurrah as he escapes from the island of Elba, assembles his forces, wins over the fickle French, uh, to his program of trying to reignite the empire and, and then is defeated famously at Waterloo. We didn't talk that much though about the Vienna system, the Vienna settlement. I mean there are a lot of different ways of describing it, a lot of different terms. I've written a lot of them up here. Metternich system is one of the most common, obviously Congress of Vienna or the Vienna system you hear sometimes. Uh, you hear talk of a quadruple alliance, of a holy alliance. You hear about a Congress system. You hear about the concert of Europe. Now, all of these things, they're not exactly the same things, but they're kind of related to a general approach to international affairs. Now, Metternich, I wrote his full name up here. Um, <laughs> Prince Clemens Wenzel Nepomuk Lothar von Metternich Weinberg Beilstein. Now, the reason I find this interesting, a man with how many names is it? So we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven names. A man with seven names. Well, those names, of course, this is in classic Habsburg style. Those names, of course, all refer to, you know, grand families, princely houses, aristocratic lines of descent that have relations to claims on various territory. Now, in a very literal sense, this was the principle of Metternich and his system. The most important phrase, in fact, more than all of these other phrases talk about concerts and alliances and so on, the key concept that we have to master to understand the Metternich system is the idea of rule by legitimate dissent. Now, if we wind back to the French Revolution, particularly its radical phase when you remember both the king and queen had been, of course, guillotined, their heads chopped off, etc., um, leading to this period of chaos. Now, the idea was that this eruption of kind of popular, demotic, democratic, you can see the root of the words are the same, demotic, demonic, democratic, you get the idea. This kind of dangerous, violent energy which emerged from the mob has to be contained. And the best way to contain it is to go back to the old ways. Um, in a certain sense, in fact, this is one of the reasons why France was able to negotiate rather improbably this deal where they've got to just go back to the status quo ante of 1789 as if the previous 25 years hadn't happened, even though they had, of course, killed how many millions of people, destroyed how much property, they basically got to go back to the old days, the Ancien Regime, the old regime, as it was called, uh, the borders of 1789. There were a few other territorial adjustments. Austria got back most of what it had previously run in northern Italy. Um, Prussia, actually, this is, the, the British later on lamented this as the greatest mistake that they had signed off in the Congress of Vienna on Prussia gaining territory in western Germany, the, the Ruhr district, with its coal and iron deposits. Of course, in 1815, no one knew yet quite how important coal and iron would be a hundred years later, nor did they necessarily know how much coal and iron was there. Um, but so there were a few territorial adjustments, the most significant of which was the ending of the Holy Roman Empire. That had already been destroyed, remember, by Napoleon. It was reconfigured into something called the German Confederation, which, if you remember going back to Richelieu's time, the Holy Roman Empire then, in the Westphalia settlement, had been split apart into about 300 different entities. Now it would be 30. Um, you could almost call this, in a way, the, the Goldilocks principle. If you know the, the legend of Goldilocks, you know, not too hot, not too cold, just the right temperature. They didn't want Germany to be too weak, that is, as weak as Richelieu had made it. They also didn't want Germany to be too strong, because if you unified all of the German-speaking states, it would emerge as 
a potential hegemon just as dangerous as France. And so the idea instead was to have it somewhere in the middle where there were certain provisions allowing the Confederation to unite, but only in case of a defensive war. That is, only if France attacked again could the Articles be invoked such that there would be a unified military command and the states could actually then essentially act as one. They certainly could not do so for an offensive war. Um, so you put all of this together. Now you can see why there is a certain line of dissent, you might say, going back to Richelieu, even though he was French and Metternich was Austrian. And then, of course, later on, we will see Bismarck. Bismarck is the person who actually, ironically, destroys Metternich's system for Germany. But in many ways, they were men of a similar philosophy, that philosophy usually being called something like realism. Um, now, Metternich was not maybe as cynical or amoral a realist as either Richelieu or later Bismarck would be. In some ways, you could say that the Metternich contribution was kind of having been chastened. Now, the way Metternich saw things, there are some interesting quotes which laid out his philosophy. Now, he was, again, he was not a kind of cynical Machiavellian type who was trying to manipulate everyone. He was rather someone trying to prevent another catastrophe, like the one that had just overtaken Europe. As he put it, he was little given to abstract ideas we accept things as they are and try to protect ourselves against delusions about reality. Now, if you take this idea a little further, what he meant was he wasn't just opposed to all of this stuff like popular sovereignty, nationalism, democracy, liberalism, everything that had been, again, kind of this, this energy unleashed by the French Revolution and Napoleon. To a certain extent, he was also suspicious of what, for lack of a better word, we might call the other side. That is the crusading, the crusading vision of really the lead power of the coalition, the Russians and the Tsar Alexander I, who himself was wont of talking about things like an order of, an order of international affairs based on the exalted truths of the eternal religion of our savior. See, his idea was more ideological. The Russian idea, partly the idea of the messianic vision of the Orthodox Church, Russia as being the inheritor of the first Rome, the second Rome, that being Constantinople, Istanbul, Moscow is the third Rome. Metternich, although he was willing to ally with the Russians because he needed them to kind of guarantee his order because they had the largest army, he was deeply wary of those kinds of abstractions. Now, as he put it, the kind of talk that was emanating from the Tsar and the Russians. These were, quote, phrases which on close examination dissolve in thin air, an idea such as, quote, the defense of civilization. This is something that the Russians were already beginning to talk about. Usually they meant Christianity, of course, but a defense of Europe, a defense of civilization. This is how the Russians would justify themselves in the Crimean War against the Ottoman Empire, again in 1877. Metternich is already, that is, suspicious of the Russian danger vis-a-vis -vis the Ottoman Empire. Now, it's ironic that the Ottomans were not actually invited to the Congress of Vienna, because to a certain extent, now that the French danger had passed, the real danger facing European statesmen was all to do with the Ottoman Empire. Ottoman weakness and potentially the, the threat that that weakness might draw in predatory powers like the Russians. If you go back to the middle of the Napoleonic period, I mentioned this briefly, it was not something that was widely known at the time but became known sort of in retrospect. This near deal cut between Napoleon and the Tsar Alexander I to partition the Ottoman Empire. You remember I talked about how part of the reason it didn't come off is because the Tsar did not allow Napoleon to marry his sister. It's sort of a humorous way of looking at it which is partly true. In the end probably though there would have been mistrust between the French and the Russians. This is something that's going to happen again and again over the next century or so. Different powers consider partitioning, that is, breaking apart the Ottoman Empire. But then they have to kind of pull back when they realize, well, if we try to do this, then the other powers are going to want a peace too. And so how do we agree amongst ourselves 
to partition the Ottoman Empire without going to war with one another. I mean, this in a nutshell is what we usually refer to as the Eastern question. Now, what's interesting about this is it all mixes together in the Metternich mind, in the Metternich philosophy. Because on the one hand, you have the danger of nationalism. The Ottoman Empire, after all, is made up famously of what, a half dozen or even a dozen nationalities, depending on how you define it. You know, if you talk about religion, well, obviously you've got Orthodox subjects, you've got Christian, you know, Catholic and other versions of Christian subjects. You've got the Muslim majority, obviously. Um, to a certain extent, you even had some other non-Christian, non-Muslim, you know, Zoroastrians and that sort of thing. You could also talk about nationality. And, of course, there you have the Greeks and you have the Armenians. You have the kind of the, the Turkic mass, you might call it, you know, based in the Crimea and, and Rumeli and, and in also, of course, Anatolia proper. Um, you have the Arabs. Uh, you have Kurds. Um, you even have to a certain extent, I mean, you have some Persians. Um, you had a whole range of different groups in the Ottoman Empire. I mean, even in the Balkans, there you're looking, of course, at, at mostly Christians. But again, you're looking at mostly Orthodox Christians, but of different nationalities. You've got Serbs and Croats. You also have Albanians, who are mostly Muslim, but of a kind of slightly different national character and language than some of the other Muslims. Um, you had Bulgarians, obviously. Those were, in fact, probably the most important group later in the century. So the Ottoman Empire could be a testing ground, again, for another explosion of all of this stuff. Irredentism, this phrase that we wasn't really used yet at the time, but it captures the idea, the idea that everyone speaking a single language should be united in the same borders. Now, there was a reason that Metternich, I think, perceived this danger more kind of clearly and earlier than anyone else, and that was, of course, that Austria itself faced the same situation. Austria had a kind of German-speaking elite, although many like Metternich spoke French as well, although they were kind of of Germanic background. Austria, of course, also had a very large Hungarian minority. Uh, there were Czechs. There were Ruthenes, as we call them sometimes. The Russians like to think of them just as kind of Russians or Ukrainians, Monke. Um, you also had, particularly once Austria started eyeing the Balkans, I mean, you had to start thinking about other subjects like Croats and Serbs. Um, Austria itself then had uh, more than a half dozen easily, possibly even more nationalities it had to deal with. And so here you begin to see the real appeal of this idea to statesmen. If, in a way, it's almost like um, uh, putting we have this phrase in English, putting the genie back in the bottle. You know, like you rub the bottle and the genie comes out. You're trying to put the genie back in the bottle. You know, the genie being, again, democracy, popular sovereignty, these ideas about nationalism, liberalism, popular democracy, all of these things which, to Metternich's mind, were dangerous, not just because they had just produced these wars of the French Revolution and Napoleon, but because they could very easily produce another war, whether in the Balkans or Ottoman Rumeli, or you know, even further east in the Ottoman Empire, if the Russians are coming in through the Caucasus, the Caucasus itself being, of course, an ethnic cauldron of different peoples. You begin to see why Metternich thought this way. Now, again, the philosophy, the more you think about it, the more it makes sense. But the thing that's so unique and striking about it, I think, to the modern mind, it's interesting that Kissinger, you can tell if you're reading his book right now, Kissinger is very fond of Metternich. In fact, he wrote his doctoral dissertation about Metternich. That was kind of like his great passion, even before he became this you know, famous diplomat, was studying Metternich. Because after all, it goes completely against the cant of the modern age. The cant, that is the kind of, uh, the catch phrases which we hear over and over again today. I suppose in an IR department, the most prominent of these would be democratic peace theory. Um, different versions of this percolate around from time to time. You know, it depends on how you model it with your independent variables and so on. Do democracies go to war with one another? The kind of thing IR theorists like to think about. Uh, my own favorite version of this was coined by, um, uh, the New York Times foreign affairs columnist Thomas Friedman, this was in March of uh, 1999, he was trying to improve on the democratic peace theory to try to explain 
in even more vivid terms why it was that in his mind democracy was a good thing because democracies did not go to war with one another. And so he proposed a new theorem. He called it the golden arches theory. Uh, I don't have a golden pen, but uh, you can, you know, anyway, you can sort of get the idea of, oh, it's McDonald's. He was talking about McDonald's, you see. And so his theory was that no two countries in which McDonald's operates have ever nor will ever go to war with one another. Now he propounded this theory in March of 1999, just about four or five days before the combined democratic forces of NATO, 19 countries, began bombing Belgrade, although narrowly missing all of the local McDonald's franchises with their bombs. <laughs> but his theory only lasted about four days before it was disproved. Uh, you get the idea anyway. Again, we talk a lot about democracy today and this supposed idea that democracies are peace-loving. That's not at all the way people thought 200 years ago. In fact, that's not how people have thought for most of the last 2,000 years. Of course, if you go back to the ancient world, particularly ancient Greece, if you remember your Hegev, there was one power which actually seemed more keen on war than any others in, let's say, the 5th century BC, that is on the Greek peninsula. One power which kept invading other powers, well, other city-states' territories. And that was Athens, of course, the birthplace of modern democracy. Athens, which famously even had a popular debate uh, uh, with, I think, Pericles making one of the closing arguments, along with uh, Themistocles, uh, basically proposing to invade Sicily for no other reason than that they kind of felt like doing it, right? That being Athenian democracy, that being the mob. Well, anyway, until very recently, this is pretty much the way most statesmen have thought about international affairs. Democracies or a democratic foreign policy would be inherently unstable. Unstable because popular opinion is fickle, it changes quickly, also because it's very easy to, of course, whip up the mob. I keep talking about the roots of the word, but of course, we have word like demos, meaning the people. We, of course, also have this word demagogue, which is very important. All of these have, of course, the same root as democracy. Now, the ancient idea, again, was that it was dangerous to ask the people what they wanted. Because, first of all, it would depend on how you phrase the question. But second of all, there was a very good chance that what the people would want was not necessarily the best thing. But if you ask the people what they wanted, let's say if you went from the evidence of, what, 1792, who declared war in 1792? Do we remember? Was it France or the coalition? It was France. It was a democratically elected popular assembly in France trying to, of course, cater to public opinion, which declared war and thus unleashed a quarter century of bitter and destructive warfare. So somebody like Metternich, who was, for all of his faults, certainly not unintelligent, this is the way he thought about this. Now, as he said, you have to be suspicious of fine phrases, you have to be suspicious of democracy, but you also want to be suspicious of crusading Russian czars, you know, who were talking about missions of protecting civilization and Christianity. Basically, what you really wanted was for statesmen to get together and use a set of agreed upon principles, again, the idea of rule by legitimate descent, that is, royal houses would rule this territory or that territory. This was the way, then, of preserving the peace. Well, it's curious, though, if you think about who Metternich was, why he became so important. Because, yes, he had some good ideas and so on and so forth, but Austria was hardly the leading military power in Europe. In fact, Metternich's ideas might not have mattered at all, except that they particularly dovetailed with both the interests and even, to a certain extent, the philosophy of what was the greatest, shall we say, world power, if not necessarily land power, and that was Britain. Britain, remember, had always been suspicious. This is something you hear a lot about, kind of British intellectual life. 
or you might even call it anti-intellectual life. British, the British have always been, as a kind of culture, suspicious of abstract ideas. You know, they thought that the French Enlightenment philosophers, they got way too fancy, way too abstract with their ideas, which is what led to the French Revolution and all this crazy Rousseau stuff about the general will and all of that. The British, I mean, in a curious way, with all this modern craze for constitution building, Britain actually doesn't have a constitution. It never has. The idea is just basically you get the kind of accretion of law over the centuries, Tradition, this is the way we do things. This is precedent. We do them not because there's a theory behind it, but just because that's the way we do them and because of trial and error, it seems to be the best way of doing it. Metternich's philosophy is kind of dovetailing nicely with this, also because Britain has no real interest in, uh, shall we say, strengthening or weakening any particular power in Europe. Britain, remember, wants a balance of power. And what Metternich basically wants is the status quo. He wants to preserve things as they are. Now, it may be that this was just a confluence of circumstance, a kind of um, coincidence that Metternich's interests dovetailed with Britain's interests. But there were some, I think, serious grounds for seeing one another as potential allies. Now, Britain did not, I mean, the thing about the British in the modern world you have to appreciate is they don't really do alliances. Um, this is, I'm talking again about classical Britain in its era of world power. Partly because they're aloof, partly because they were, of course, you know, the greatest power. They will join coalitions and wars, certainly but they almost never do permanent alliances. And so even though Metternich trying to set up a kind of formal security architecture to uphold these principles, Britain stayed somewhat aloof. There was something called the Quadruple Alliance, that is the, the four main powers who had kind of destroyed the French armies, Britain, Prussia, Austria, Russia. It never really amounted to anything though. Now, the Tsar, remember, with his ideas about defending Europe against civilization, well, his ideas, Metternich was willing to indulge them up to a point. And so they came up with something they called the Holy Alliance. The idea is that Prussia, Austria, and Russia, they were three kind of conservative Christian powers, you know, who all, you know, they were more conservative in a way than Britain, because even though Britain was a status quo, balance of power type of country, Britain, remember, also was a parliamentary system where Britain at least stood for certain principles of liberalism. Um, so they think, okay, well this will be our thing. This is like the European continental thing. It never really amounted to a whole lot necessarily, though in part because it was supposed to be a Christian alliance, but you have here one country, Prussia, which is which Christian denomination? Do we remember? Protestant or Catholic? Russia's Protestant, Austria's almost entirely Catholic, and Russia, of course, is Orthodox. So they don't even necessarily agree with each other about confessions. That said, there's something to it. I mean, in a way, these powers, what they really do stand for is this idea of conservatism. You know, again, freezing time, turning back the clock, pretending like the French Revolution never happened. Now, with Russia, there was always this tinge of kind of... Um, messianic vision. The Russians are still, you know, talking about this idea that goes back to Kuchukainarja, Catherine the Great, the idea of, you know, the second Rome, of maybe conquering the Ottoman Empire. The Russians, they're sort of volatile. You can't entirely trust them. But for now, at least, both Prussia and Austria are interested in maintaining the status quo. Now, the big question diplomatically in Central Europe is, um, I think I wrote it up here, it's this idea of, uh, with the German confederation of either big or little Germany. That is, if Germany will ever be united, will it include Prussia and Austria? That would be big Germany or just small Germany with Prussia. But so long as Metternich was in power and his system was operating, neither Prussia nor Austria would try to unify Germany because basically they don't want to kind of disturb the status quo. Now, this may not last forever again because Prussia, remember, has already gained some territory, particularly in Western Germany. Later on, 
a lot of German liberals and nationalists will actually think about the idea of unifying Germany using Prussia because Prussia, the difference is that Prussia, although it has a Polish minority, Prussia is almost exclusively German. So remember the irredentist principle that everyone speaking a single language should be in the same borders. That works better with Prussia than with Austria because Austria has racial minorities. For now, though, the idea is we don't want anything like that to happen because it'll eventually lead to instability and probably war. Now, Britain, remember, Britain is aloof from all this. Britain doesn't really particularly care about this notion of a conservative alliance of Christian emperors. The quadruple alliance, they don't take that terribly seriously either. In fact, oddly enough, the British idea that they tried to animate during this, this Congress and afterwards, the, the Congress of Vienna, was to set up something that they initially called the Congress system. That is, it's not like it's an alliance. It's more like an agreement that the powers will continually meet to adjudicate disputes and problems. Uh, Kissinger in his book makes the interesting point that this prefigured the League of Nations idea of the 20th century and that even more coincidentally it was a British idea which was actually scotched by the British. In other words, it was proposed by the British by Castlereagh at the Congress but then once he kind of got back to London everyone else said no, 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 we don't want these sort of entangling alliances and so we're not going to do it. Uh, very famously, of course, President Woodrow Wilson, it wasn't really his idea, but he took the League of Nations idea and kind of made it his own, and then he brought it back to America, and of course, the treaty was not ratified by the U.S. Congress, therefore, the whole thing was a dead letter. So it's kind of similar. It's like uh, the British version of those ideas, which Britain pushed for at the conference, but then Britain later dropped it. Now, confusingly, you sometimes hear this other phrase, the concert of Europe. Now, this is not something that was ever kind of, again, an actual formal treaty or arrangement. This is more like what happened after, it's more like the compromise version of all of these things. Eventually, the powers just decided that when they needed to, when there was any kind of a major crisis, they would get together and kind of hold these meetings. Now, the concert basically consists of these powers. Eventually, France becomes a part of it, too. It doesn't consist of the Ottomans. The Ottomans are not really invited in. They are after the Crimean War, not until 1856. Although, of course, ironically, that is after the concert of Europe is pretty much a dead letter <laughs> because of the Crimean War. We'll go into that in a moment. But anyway, this is the system, this is the idea, the architecture, partly to contain France, more than that to contain kind of popular uh, nationalism, you know, democracy and all the rest of it, but particularly to contain this irredentist danger of kind of national, you know, ethnic groupings trying to proclaim independence or launch wars. And in that case, it's particularly directed at the Ottoman Empire. Well, how well does it work? Well, I mean, in the aggregate, the system works pretty well, at least between the major powers, between these powers and France, there is no major war until 1914. So you sometimes hear that the Congress of Vienna was again a great success because it kept the peace for a hundred years. Yes, you could say that. You could also say though that it kept the general peace, but of course did nothing to prevent minor conflicts. On the other hand, you could also say that those minor conflicts did not spiral out of control because of this principle that the great powers would get together. Now, as for which con conflicts I'm talking about, before we get to the, the Eastern question Ottoman stuff, because that in a way is really the crux of the matter, just a basic kind of timeline of at least what we might call kind of grand politics in Europe in the classic years of the Metternich era. In France, you got the Bourbon Restoration, right? The old kings come back. The kings which, the dynasty which goes back to uh, Henry IV and his Paris is worth a mass. The dynasty of all the Louis, you know, Louis the Sun King, Louis XVI. They're brought back. And oddly enough, because uh, the Dauphin, the, the, the son of Louis XVI, was no longer around, the, the new king was actually called Louis the, anyone want to guess the number? 16th. You got to skip a number. It was the 18th. Yeah, Louis the 18th, right? And then after that, you had Charles the 9th. Um, anyway, you have a couple of Bourbon kings. France, for a while, seems to kind of sort of go back to normal. Although, of course, if you've watched The Count of Monte Cristo, you know that there were all these you know, conspirators and so on. 
even there it doesn't last though. France has yet another revolution in 1830. I mean the thing about France, it, it's interesting, a couple of years ago, you probably remember hearing all this stuff about the car burnings in France, you know, the cars being set on fire. You know, and, and there are all these different things people were saying about them. You know, on the one hand you have the problem of assimilation and immigration and, you know, are these immigrants, is it a Muslim thing, is it an African thing, is it a race thing, is it a crime thing? But one argument that I didn't hear very much is that it actually was successful assimilation, that is to French traditions, because after all, the French have always been, at least since the 18th century, people that just kind of love having revolutions. I mean, it, it's amazing. Like, whenever there is a major strike and the truckers, you know, like they overturn their trucks and they block the roads, there's this guy called Jose Beauvais, uh, who calls himself like a some sort of a peasant populist. He's actually one of those like university educated Marxists. And he always goes and torches the McDonald's. Like he'll lead like these parades to attack McDonald's. And then you have the students. And almost every year around about I think October, November, like around this time, maybe a little bit earlier, they actually take to the streets of Paris and they, they have these you know, they like jump on cars and they do all the rest of it. In fact a couple of years ago there, there was a fascinating dynamic where um, the students were, were holding their annual rally. It, well, as to what they're protesting, who knows? I mean, usually it's like they want more money for the schools or this or that. It doesn't really matter. It's just they love getting out and, you know, getting in the fresh air and jumping on the cars and everything. So what happened was that some of these kind of suburban rioters, you know, the North Africans, had come to the city to hold their own sort of, you know, protest riot. And they saw all these white students, you know, rioting. And then they decided to sort of like intimidate and beat up the white students, you know, saying like, you guys aren't real rebels. And they actually got in these clashes, you know, and it's a, it's a fascinating situation because it just seems to be something which is in the political culture in France. I mean, you can go to these places like the Hôtel de Ville and the Place de la Révolution and you can practically feel it in the air, you know, that this is where the mobs were chanting for blood and this is where they had the guillotine. Anyway, so they have another revolution in 1830. Remember, they had one in 1789. Arguably, they had another one in 1792, you know, when they attacked the Tuileries, uh, you know, got the king and queen. They had a bunch of them, really, in the 1790s, if you count all the different days. Well, this one, yet again, the mob is sort of out in the streets of Paris, you know, a la lanterne, the barricades, all the rest of it. Um, this revolution does not lead to quite as radical a situation as the previous one does. Partly, though, remember, because now Europe is watching, remember. Everyone is afraid of this happening again. And so, you know, the, the diplomats and the statesmen in Vienna, in London, in Berlin, they are all watching. You know, and they don't want this thing to spiral out of control. In fact, oddly enough, Talleyrand, you know, the, the diplomat I talked about who, to some extent, had really won France a better deal than she deserved at the Congress of Vienna. The first thing Talleyrand did when the mob took to the streets in 1830 was he hopped across the English Channel and he just kind of went to reassure the British and he said, look, don't worry, the French are like this. You know, they just, they do this every so often. It's not going to amount to anything. Just hold on, everything will be under control within a few months. And lo and behold, he was right. Eventually, the mob was kind of taken over by, and you know, actually the most amazing thing about this revolution is, I didn't talk very much about the Marquis de Lafayette, but, um, so Lafayette, uh, Lafayette was, uh, they called him the hero of two continents because he played sort of a small role in the American Revolution. He was once upon a time an aide-de-camp to George Washington, the, uh, you know, the sort of the father of America's Republic and the first president of the United States. Um, so like back in, I guess, I think even at the time of the, of the French Indian War in the 1750s, you know, he was actually kind of helping the American side. Now this wouldn't have been... 70s. Anyway, so like 50 years ago, no, 70 years ago, he's at the side of George Washington in America, you know, kind of learning his trade in the American army. Then he comes back to France, and in 1789, by this point he's got to be, I don't know, like 40 years old maybe. Anyway, 1789, he's already this sort of hero who a lot of people think, you know, played a role in the American Revolution. And so he is appointed the commander of the National Guard, the, the sort of like the patriotic militia that they create. So that's 17. 89, so he must have been again about like 40 years old now. Well, now we're 41 years later, and the guy's like 80. And when the crowd took to the streets, he went out there again, and he addressed the crowds, and he sort of like took over the fervor of the revolution and, you know, denounced 
tyranny and the bourbons and all the rest of it. And so you have this, it's almost like a farce, really. I mean, this is, it's this revolution and then the next one in 1848. This is, this is what Marx was talking about with his line now where he said, history always repeats itself. The first time is tragedy, the second as farce. You know, meaning it's like funny. Um, so that's Lafayette, 1830. Eventually you get this thing they call the July or, quote, bourgeois monarchy of Louis Philippe. Um, he called himself, and this was the phrase, the king of the French, that is not of France, so that he was supposed to be a kind of popular king or something. But although they did have a certain representative system, I mean they had a kind of sort of parliament, what they did was they made the, the vote was so restricted you had to be you know, extremely wealthy or a major landowner to participate in the system. Um, so the whole thing was controlled very rigidly in a way the first French Revolution had not been. You know, Talleyrand was right. The, basically the people in charge. The, the critics of this called this government a kind of an oligarchy, you know, an oligarchy of the rich. And so partly for that reason, Europe does not intervene and they don't invade France. There is a minor crisis when uh, the Poles kind of rise up again to try to declare independence, you know, mostly against Russia. Uh, and France kind of sort of supports that. But the whole thing is contained. It's contained by Metternich, it's contained by the British, and it's contained, I think, ultimately in some larger sense by the threat of another Russian intervention. Uh, by this time, it's no longer Alexander I, it's Nicholas I in Russia. Russia had its own pseudo-revolution in 1825. But so, the system kind of works. You know, it keeps things under control. Um, the next revolution, which again starts in Paris, as seemingly all revolutions do, uh, was eventually called the Springtime of the Peoples. This was 1848, and this is because it spread throughout Europe. They were like copycat, you know, uprisings, yet again in Poland, in kind of the Hungarian areas of the Habsburg Austro-Hungarian Empire against Austria, in Italy, and even inside the German Confederation, where a bunch of you know, lawyers and would-be politicians actually convened and elected the so-called Frankfurt Parliament. Um, there's actually there's an interesting postscript to this. The Frankfurt Parliament offered the crown, basically, of a new German empire uh, to the Prussian king, Friedrich Wilhelm IV. And he refused. He said, no thanks. <laughs> As he put it, um, he didn't want a crown, quote, from the gutter. That is, from the people from you know, below, from the demos, from the mob. Now this is partly again because he is taking his orders you know, on the one hand from the Austrians but even more from the Russians. The Holy Alliance was kind of like in action in 1848. So that even though the Germans and all of those small states of the German Confederation were willing to accept Prussian leadership in a new unified Germany, Prussia said no even though it would expand Prussian power. And the reason that they said no was, again, to uphold this principle of legitimacy, to suppress democracy. That, incidentally, was the source of the famous Bismarck quote about how uh, the questions of the day uh, would be decided not by uh, speeches and majority votes, but by blood and iron. You know, his idea that, that, uh, that Germany should not be, as he put it, uh, Dis, uh, should not be dishonored by any, quote, disgraceful connection to democracy. <laughs> That's one of my favorite Bismarck quotes, but there are more. Um, so anyway, so again, the system kind of sort of works. Now, in 1848, it worked because the Russians actually did send troops. They sent troops to help the Austrians suppress the Hungarian rebellion, the Italian rebellion, and they also sent troops to suppress the Polish rebellion inside Austria. So that, you know, behind all of this kind of pseudo-ideology of reaction, of course you had to have force. In the end, the thing wouldn't have worked without it. So Russia was, you would say, the ultimate guarantor of these various treaties, because Russia ultimately had the troops to bear. Britain, remember, is always kind of on the outside looking in. Britain does not want these great perturbations and disturbances in European affairs. Britain doesn't want revolutions either. But on the other hand, Britain is not really willing to send troops to intervene. They might offer some support behind the scenes. The other thing is, I mean, the British, remember, are not quite as reactionary as these other powers. 
You know, the British would never use a phrase like disgraceful connection to democracy. You remember that that was one of the paradoxes of the Napoleonic era, that even though France supposedly stood for popular sovereignty and democracy, Napoleon, after all, was essentially an unaccountable tyrant who did not have to answer to any democratic body. Britain, despite standing for, again, kind of what you might call uh, the establishment, Britain did have a parliament, which did actually matter. It's true the parliament in Britain, even the House of Commons, was fairly exclusive in the franchise and the suffrage. But that said, it did matter. Britain had a monarchy, but the real power resided in parliament. And so Britain was always a little wary of all of this stuff. You know, Britain would never out and out endorse Metternich's principles. Britain would never out and out endorse reaction. In fact, to a certain extent, British public opinion actually sympathized with the revolutionaries. I mean, that was true even in the first French Revolution. There were all these societies in Britain that you know, believed in liberty and democracy and all the rest of it. British statesmen, however, I think always took a more Metternich esque view of things. That is, they might instinctively sympathize with something like the Frankfurt Parliament of Liberals who want Germany to be democratic, but they would not go so far as to actually support it or recognize it if the other powers didn't. Ultimately for Britain, sentiment, that is sentimental ideas about democracy, mattered much less than did ultimately the balance of power. At least that was true I would say up until about the time of the Russo-Ottoman War of 1877 when Gladstone gets up on his soapbox and introduces the moralizing element in foreign policy. I mean, there was always a tension. Kissinger makes a lot of this in his book when he's talking about the League of Nations, the Woodrow Wilson connection. There's always been a tension like this in American foreign policy too, although the Americans tend to come down much more on the side of idealism and intervention than the kind of more isolationist, pragmatic, conservative balance of power idea. The British usually would fall down on the side of the balance of power where they would not want to intervene. Um, for the most part, what Britain is really concerned about is simply trade and you know, securing the sea routes to British India. So long, that is, as there is no new Napoleon in Europe, uh, Britain is not excessively concerned. Oh, there's one small exception to that rule. I, di I didn't mention it. It's kind of a, it's an afterthought at the time, but it becomes important later. Um, one of the small territorial adjustments of the Vienna settlement was what to do with uh, Belgium. Uh, essentially, Belgium, I mean, Belgium didn't exist yet, but the territory that would become Belgium, because France is part of what is called the Low Countries, very easy to invade because there are no natural obstacles. France, you know, and, and Holland had fought many wars, remember, back in the 17th century. Um, Britain eventually decides that it is a key enough principle of British foreign policy on the continent that they do not want any major power to control the coastline which is nearest to England, basically what is now modern Belgium. And so they actually do create this independent state of Belgium in 1839. Um, the end, you should remember this simply because it, it plays a major role in 1914 in the outbreak of the First World War. Uh, Britain is the prime sponsor of the creation of independent Belgium. Um, the other powers, however, also sign and recognize it so that it becomes a cardinal principle of Britain. First, Belgium, they're supposed to remain neutral in all conflicts, and Britain is supposed to uphold that neutrality. I mean, that was formally speaking the casus belli which brought Britain into the First World War because of the German uh, violation of Belgian neutrality. I think we're towards the end of the first hour here, so why don't we take a break, and when we get back, we'll look more closely at uh, the Ottomans and the Eastern question. necessarily know how much coal and iron was there. Um, but so there were a few territorial adjustments, the most significant of which was the ending of the Holy Roman Empire. That had already been destroyed, remember, by Napoleon. It was reconfigured into something called the German Confederation, which, if you remember going back to Richelieu's time, the Holy Roman Empire then in the Westphalia settlement had been split apart into about 300 different entities. Now it would be 30. Um, 
You could almost call this, in a way, the, the Goldilocks principle. If you know the, the legend of Goldilocks, you know, not too hot, not too cold, just the right temperature. They didn't want Germany to be too weak, that is, as weak as Richelieu had made it. They also didn't want Germany to be too strong, because if you unified all of the German-speaking states, it would emerge as a potential hegemon just as dangerous as... The best way to contain it is to go back to the old ways. Um, in a certain sense, in fact, this is one of the reasons why France was able to negotiate rather improbably this deal where they've got to just go back to the status quo ante of 1789 as if the previous 25 years hadn't happened. Even though they had, of course, killed how many millions of people, destroyed how much property, they basically got to go back to the old days. The Ancien Regime, the old regime, as it was called. Uh, the borders of 1789. There were a few other territorial adjustments. Austria got back most of what it had previously run in northern Italy. Um, Prussia, actually, this is... The, the British later on lamented this as the greatest mistake that they had signed off in the Congress of Vienna on Prussia gaining territory in western Germany, the, the Ruhr district with its coal and iron deposits. Of course, in 1815, no one knew yet quite how important coal and iron would be 100 years later, nor did they know. Well, begin, I think, yes, we are basically at class time. It uh, looks like the usual post midterm turnout. Um, nice to see all of you anyway. Thank you for coming. Um, I think it's an interesting theme today. We already alluded a little bit to what's going on at the time of the Congress of Vienna. Last week we talked about, of course, the, uh, the famous hundred days, which curiously actually took place during the Congress of Vienna. The hundred days, remember, being Napoleon's kind of last hurrah as he escapes from the island of Elba assembles his forces, wins over the fickle French uh, to his program of trying to reignite the empire and, and then is defeated famously at Waterloo. We didn't talk that much though about the Vienna system, the Vienna relations to claims on various territory. Now, in a very literal sense, this was the principle of Metternich and his system. The most important phrase, in fact, more than all of these other phrases talk about concerts and alliances and so on, the key concept that we have to master to understand the Metternich system is the idea of rule by legitimate dissent. Now, if we wind back to the French Revolution, particularly its radical phase, when you remember both the king and queen had been, of course, guillotined, their heads chopped off, etc., um, leading to this period of chaos. Now, the idea was that this eruption of kind of popular, demotic, democratic, you can see the root of the words are the same, demotic, demonic, democratic, you get the idea. This kind of dangerous, violent energy which emerged from the mob has to be contained. And settlement. I mean, there are a lot of different ways of describing it, a lot of different terms. I've written a lot of them up here. Metternich system is one of the most common, obviously Congress of Vienna or the Vienna system you hear sometimes. Uh, you hear talk of a quadruple alliance, of a holy alliance. You hear about a Congress system. You hear about the concert of Europe. Now, all of these things, they're not exactly the same things, but they're kind of related to a general approach to international affairs. Now, Metternich, I wrote his full name up here, um, <laughs> Prince Clemens Wenzel Nepomek Lothar von Metternich Weinberg Beilstein. Now, the reason I find this interesting, a man with how many names is it? So we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven names. A man with seven names. Well, those names, of course, this is in classic Habsburg style. Those names, of course, all refer to, you know, grand families, princely houses, aristocratic lines of descent that have...